Welcome back everyone to our 2028 end seminar. This is part five entitled Creation Day 2, Noah's Ark and the Global Flood. And if you've been following along with this series, you know what we're doing here. We're revealing the secret prophecies God made in each creation day about the greatest event to occur in that day's future prophesied millennium. Remember, the only reason, hear me, the only reason God used seven days in the creation story was to be able to declare the time of the end from the very beginning. Time is told using numbers. So each of the seven creation days prophesied of a future 1,000 year period for a total 7,000 year plan God had for planet Earth. And to validate this truth, God did something astounding. He hid prophecies in the wording of each creation day's events, foretelling the greatest event to occur in that day's future fulfillment millennium. This is the greatest revelation of our time. If everyone learned these prophetic truths about the Bible, it could change the world. So here we are at creation day number two, and I'm about to reveal to you the secret words God hid in this day's events, prophesying the global flood of Noah's day, which the Bible confirms took place during Earth's second 1,000 year period. And then I'm gonna to reveal to you the importance of the story of Noah, the ark, and the global flood. I'm going to show you how the entire story was one massive, real-life, prophetic parable about Jesus Christ's second coming and the end of the world. In other words, the story of Noah is prophecy that's not yet fulfilled. God even declared in the story that the end will come Earth's 6,000th year. So this is the second time he's prophesied that fact. The first one being in the creation story, as we already learned. So stay with me, because what I got to tell you is really going to bless you. All right, so Creation Day 2's narrative reads like this. And God said, let there be a firmament or an expanse of sky in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Phew! There's a lot of water talked about in this day's events, and that's not by accident. So what are the secret prophetic words foretelling the global flood of Noah's day? It's the line, let there be a sky in the midst of the waters. Friend, those words prophesied of the flood, for that was the first time it rained all over earth. In other words, that was the first time the sky was full of water. The sky was in the midst of the waters. Listen, until the flood event happened, it had never rained on earth. The Bible says there went up a mist from the earth and it watered the whole face of the ground. But at the time of the flood, the Bible says the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. There's your fulfillment verse. During the worldwide flood, the skies were in the midst of the waters for the very first time. So Genesis 7:11 is literally the fulfillment verse for what God had prophesied to happen in Genesis 1-6. Pretty amazing, huh? 
And even if you're of the camp where you believe rain fell on earth before Noah's flood, just understand that the global flood event was the first time the earth's entire sky was in the midst of the waters. The entire expanse of sky surrounding the earth contained rain. This is the fulfillment of what God prophesied in day two of creation. So let's confirm Noah's flood took place during Earth's second 1,000 year period. It's remarkable that we even have this information. But God was careful to include the birth ages of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah, which was the first ten fathers, and then Noah's age when the flood happened. So we can know the exact year the flood happened from creation. Now, why would God do this? Friend, it's so we'd have proof of the things I'm telling you today. It's so you would know, without a doubt, that Noah's story happened during Earth's second millennium, perfectly fulfilling Creation Day 2's prophecy. So here's a chart showing the birth ages of the fathers. And you can get this information in chapters 5 and 7 of Genesis. And it's easy to add up. You'll see Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. And Seth was 105 years old when Enosh was born. And so forth. And if you add it all up, which doesn't take long, you'll learn Noah was the 10th father from Adam and he was born in the year 1056. And the flood happened year 1656. So it's very clear in the Bible that the story of Noah, the ark, and the global flood all happened during Earth's second millennium, which runs from years 1000 to 2000. While we're at it, Let's fill in the year numbers on our creation chart for the beginning and ending dates for each millennium. Remember, Christ died during Earth's 4,000th year, which was A.D. 28 on our Gregorian calendars today. And I'll explain more about how we get that year for Christ's death later. But for now, backtracking 4,000 years from A.D. 28 we get a creation date of 3,972 B.C. And then the rest is easy to fill in. So using our Gregorian calendar dating method, 1,656 years after creation for the flood event brings us to the year 2,316 B.C. That's when the flood happened. So now for the fun part. What about the story of Noah, the ark, and the global flood? What's so special about it? Why would God want to prophesy of it in day two of creation? In other words, why was it going to be the greatest event of Earth's second millennium? It's as I told you earlier. It's because the entire story is itself a prophecy about the end of the world, meaning Christ's second coming. Try and grasp this fact. The story of Noah, the ark, and the global flood contained the details of how the end of the world would unfold back in a time when the Bible wasn't even written yet. Think of that. So I told you earlier the story is a real-life prophetic parable. Now listen, when you normally think of a parable, you think of the spoken word. Someone just speaks a parable, like Jesus would. But this is different. This is God literally controlling the events of a real-life story that happened on this earth so that the details and the events of the story are parabolic, delivering a prophetic message to mankind. 
I don't know about you, but I don't know of any other being in the universe that can do something like this. I mean, it's mind-boggling. So let's jump into the story. Since it's a parable, let me tell you what the things in the story represent. Noah represents Jesus, and the ark represents heaven. So Noah is going to be a prophetic picture of Jesus, and the ark he's building is going to be a prophetic picture of the literal place of heaven. Four details in the story prove the ark represents the place of heaven. Number one, God tells Noah, with lower, second, and third stories shall you make it. Later, Paul informed us, I knew a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven. This is the only time in the Bible we're told heaven has three stories. There's a first, second, and third heaven, exactly like God told Noah to build in the ark. Number two, God told Noah, make rooms in the ark. Later, Jesus came along and said, My Father's house, meaning heaven, has many rooms. See, these words from Jesus were affirming the parabolic truth of the story of Noah. The ark was a picture of heaven. And since God knew heaven has rooms, God wanted Noah to make rooms in the ark. Number three. God told Noah, you shall make a window for the ark. Later, God said, prove me if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for you. See it? Heaven has windows. So God wanted Noah to build windows in the ark. And number four, God told Noah, put a door in the side of the ark. Later, Jesus came along and said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. See, Jesus is the only door that leads into heaven. Therefore, God wanted Noah to build only one door in the side of the ark. So there you have it. It's undeniable the ark in the story of Noah is a precise picture of the place of heaven. It's the only place of safety that exists from the coming end of the world destruction. So do you see what's happening in the story of Noah? As Noah worked building the ark, he was a prophetic picture of Jesus building the place of heaven. Remember Jesus saying, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Friend, Noah is a picture of that. As he built the three stories in the ark, as he built each room in it, as he built the windows and the one door, he was a picture of Jesus preparing the place of heaven for us. And as I said, it's the only place of safety that will exist when the global end of the world destruction comes about. So when the destruction was finally at hand in the story of Noah, guess who God called into the ark? Only Noah's family. Him, his wife, his three sons and their wives, his three daughter-in-laws. God said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for you I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Friend, this detail perfectly reveals who's going to be saved when Jesus returns. It will only be Christ's family. The Bible says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, 
if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. In other words, if you've repented of your sins and you're fighting the good fight of faith, you are a son or daughter of Christ. And Jesus is the head of this household. So here it is again in the story of Noah, a precise prophetic picture of how the end of the world will unfold. Only one house of people, one righteous family, is going to be saved from the destruction. All else, all wicked people, will perish. So now for the thrilling action in the story of Noah. This is remarkable because it clearly reveals when the catching away of the believers will happen. Watch this. As Noah's flood is taking place, what happens to the ark? Remember, it's holding Noah's family. The Bible says, And the waters increased and bear up the ark, and it was lifted up high above the earth. Friend, this is the catching away event of the believers up into the air. It's what the church calls the rapture but they're confused about its timing. Look when it happens. At the same time as Noah's family is rising up into the air in the ark, all the wicked people on earth are being destroyed. In other words, there's no more time left for anyone. Do you know what that means? There's no pre-tribulation rapture event. That's a lie. And the story of Noah proves it. The believers will be caught up into the air on the same day as all the wicked people on earth are perishing. Paul says it like this, Then we which are alive and remain, meaning those of us who are still alive and remaining on earth, having made it through three and a half years of the Antichrist reign, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Them is those who have already died in Christ. They'll be returning with Jesus in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This whole event is called the gathering in the Bible. For all the believers from 6,000 years of earth's history will be gathered together on that final day. Those who have already died will be returning with Christ, and those of us still alive and remaining on the earth will be caught up to meet them in the air. And Jesus confirmed when this gathering event takes place. Immediately after the great tribulation, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So it all happens after the Antichrist three and a half year tribulation period. And here's the final proof in the story of Noah that this whole gathering event and the end of the world will happen Earth's 6,000th year and not seven years before. The Bible recorded Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. Wow. Do you get it? Friend, God carefully controlled Noah's age to be 600 when the flood event occurred to secretly prophesy the end of the world will take place earth's 6,000th year. So just like one righteous family of people, Noah's house, was caught up into the air to safety as a world of ungodly people perished in a flood of water, all when Noah was 600 years old, so too one righteous family of people, Christ's house, will be caught up into the air to safety as a world of ungodly people perish in a flood of fire, all when planet Earth 
is 6,000 years old. I am telling you the truth. The story of Noah, the ark, and the global flood is unfulfilled prophecy about the end of the world. And it will be fulfilled during Christ's return, Earth's 6,000th year, A.D. 2028. I was awakened around 8 a.m., February 27, 2008, to a voice explaining to me all the things I'm telling you about the story of Noah. As you can imagine, my mind was blown. I'd never heard anything like it in my life. No church ever taught me these things, but I've written them all down in the Noah chapter of my book. And it's one of the most fascinating chapters in the book. I don't have time in this video series to tell you everything about the story, but I do in the book. So get it and read it. I will point one more thing out, though, just briefly. The story of Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah contains the same end-of-the-world prophetic message as the story of Noah. In other words, it too is unfulfilled prophecy about the end of the world. Therefore, it too will be fulfilled on the day of Christ's return. And this information is in the Lot chapter of my book. But just realize, in this story, the same thing happens. One righteous house of people, Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, are caught up out of Sodom by angels, a picture of the rapture. On the same day, as all the wicked are being destroyed by fire, and what's really cool is when Jesus came along, he actually confirmed the stories of Noah and Lot were prophetic parables about his return. And if you'll listen closely to his words, you'll hear that he confirms what day the catching away or the rapture occurs. He made a point to say, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Do you see it? The Holy Spirit led him to say those words. And you know why? So the debate between pre-trib or post-trib rapture is over. When you understand the prophetic significance of the stories of Noah and Lot, you'll know the rapture happens on the same day as all the wicked on earth are destroyed. It's at the end. It does not happen seven years before the end. That's a lie. Friend, when the catching away of the believers happens, that's it. There's no more time to get right with God. It's over. 6,000 years of Earth's history will have been complete, and the surface of planet Earth will be completely destroyed with a flood of fire, as Peter tells us. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. See, it's the fulfillment of the story of Lot and the destruction of all the wicked by fire. Now listen to me. The church today is dreadfully ignorant of these truths, and therefore it's not speaking them. They don't understand a mass extinction event is coming during Christ's return. They're clueless, so you're not going to hear these truths through them. But at least you now know the truth of what's coming and when. 
Noah's story told it to you. Earth's 6,000th year, A.D. 2028. And one last thing. After the fire is over and all the wicked people annihilated, God is going to regenerate the surface of planet Earth back into a glorious paradise where he'll sit all the gathered righteous people back down on it, just like he sat Noah's family back down on the earth after the flood. And they'll enter into the glorious 1,000-year Sabbath reign of Jesus Christ in fulfillment of the seventh day in the creation story. So there you have it. Now you know what God prophesied in day two of creation about Earth's second millennium and why it was such a big deal. So I pray it's been a blessing to you. Well, next time, we're going to disclose what God prophesied in day three of creation. And it's every bit as fascinating as day two. So I'll see you then. Let me ask you a question you probably never pondered. Why did God create the world in six days? Do you think he had no logic, motive, or purpose behind using that specific number of days? Do you think he just placed a bunch of numbers in a hat and nonchalantly drew one? Or do you believe the cosmos required that precise number of days to be completed as if God could not have created it in one, two, five, or any other number of days. Friend, you should know better. God can do anything. Which brings us back to the original question. Why did God create the world in six days? The answer to this mystery is contained in the Bible and its gradual, albeit secret, uncovering and story after story leads to the stunning prophetic title of Gabriel Ansley Erb's book, Undeniable Biblical Proof Jesus Christ Will Return to Planet Earth Exactly 2,000 Years After the Year of His Death. But far more important than merely discovering this fact, Gabriel's book will fully elucidate and crush all confusion concerning what a person must do to obtain eternal life. For it will illuminate the true spiritual meaning behind every detail God controlled to happen in the ancient Bible stories. So sit back and hold on, because Gabriel's message is going to be a life-changing ride. Order your copy today in paperback or ebook form from Amazon.com.